today we've got Leon Dato um, from Cardinal Health. He's here to talk about leveraging the power of cu custom properties. And the reason why I'm ex so excited that he's here is he's a MVP, a SolarWinds MVP. So he's had a wealth of experience with SolarWinds since 2003. But he is also very knowledgeable um, with other IT management um, products and also roles. Like he w worked in the help desk role, but also he's worked um, in very, very large environments, scaling you know, 250,000 nodes, 5,000 uh, locations. locations. Yeah. So he's, he's very knowledgeable um, on not only t the technology, but the, the people in the process aspects of doing the day-to-day -day jobs. And he's also hilarious. So <laughs> no pressure now. I just have to be funny. Great. Thank you. Hi everybody. Okay, so we're running late. Thank you very much. It's been great talking to you. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. Good intro. Uh, thank you so much. It's wonderful to talk to everybody. I'm excited to be part of the Thwack Camp experience. Um, what we want to talk about today, as the title slide says, is leveraging custom properties. The point of this is to take it beyond what I would consider to be the normal use of custom properties, which you know, usually when people talk about custom properties, they use it for uh, you know, grouping and sorting, really. You, know, you want to only show a report with the devices that are in this subnet or this location, you know, the city, uh, or you want to use it for the managed node screen, which we'll take a look at in a moment or what have you. That's the typical use. What I want to show is something that I stumbled upon about five or six years ago, um, which allowed me to get around an issue with um, you know, SolarWinds not monitoring, monitoring, and that just dovetailed into a, a couple of different um, uses. This session is an idea starter. It's not going to necessarily give all the different permutations of custom properties, but it's going to give you enough ideas that I think you'll be able to run with it after that. So, like I said before, normally you use group and custom properties for things like groups. Like here in the screen, you can see that there's a, a property called the owner group, and that in the manage node screen, you can you know populate that, and then you know you have some things that are unknown, but the rest of them, uh, you know, you've you've got whatever grouping, whatever owner group or people, and you can use that for you know who's responsible or whatever. Another example is in alerts where. You know, the alert will only go off if the owner group is for fusion, whatever fusion is, and the production state is prod, not dev, not stage, whatever, and ultimately the node is down. Okay, fine. Um, that's great. But there's some other ways to, to play around with this that I want to explore. The first thing that I ran into was I needed alerts to stop. But I still needed to know how the device was doing. And this especially came up where we had a box that was having some issues. Um, and we were working on it, so we didn't want tickets because the box was coming up and going down. But the the team that was working on the server kept on asking me, the monitoring guy, well, is it OK now? Can we bring it up? I don't know. Because the unmanaged tool, while it's good, has a challenge. It's not collecting data. so. Yeah, I'm not cutting alerts, but I also don't know the state of the box at all. Yeah, I know. I could ping the box and find out if it's up. But that's really not the point. The point is is that um, when I've got a server that we're working on, or I have a device that's in pilot mode, so it's going to be up and down over the course of days or even weeks, I want to know how it's doing right now, but I don't want to cut tickets. Another example is when we've got a circuit, and the carrier does what's called looping the circuit. So you know, there they brought the circuit down, they're testing it in their own little, you know, looping construct. It's going to be bouncing up and down. But I can't close the ticket with the carrier until I know that circuit is rock solid. But if I mute, excuse me, if I unmanage the circuit, that interface, I'll never know. And I certainly won't know over time. I mean, I can, you know, test it now and test it five minutes from now and test it five minutes from now. And then I'll know that it's okay, sort of, kind of, but I won't know if it's dropped in the intervening minutes. So those are the reasons that I came up with this concept. And again, just to give you a, a visual, this is what the unmanage feature looks like. It's great. It's got scheduling. It's wonderful. But it just doesn't give you what you need to know how things are going right now. So at this point, what I want to do is I want to actually dig into 
the tool. Um, you know, this was this was actually supposed to be a different angry cat, but legal told us that uh, internet memes are copyrightable. So just imagine the other guy here. So what we've got is a couple of custom properties. Um, the ones I'm looking at are this far right column. I have two two fields I want to talk about at the moment, these custom properties. One is nmute, which is a true-false field. That's nmute is for node mute. And the other one is nmute reason. And we'll talk about why you need a reason for things. Uh, I know that it does set you down a path of having, you know, many, many, many fields because you have the mute reason and the, uh, sorry, the mute field and the, not, and the mute reason and the CPU field and the CPU. There's a level of reasonableness that you're going to have to take. But the mute field is simply a true-false field, and the mute reason field is simply a text field. By themselves, they do nothing. So I don't want anyone to think that this is some sort of theory magic dust that is going to suddenly make life fantastic. It, by itself, it doesn't do anything. But it leverages into a particular construct. And that construct is where I create an alert. And we'll call this the flack. Camp 2013 node down with mute. That's so that we can find it later and clean it up. And we get straight to it. This is a node. This is very simple, guys. It's a node alert, right? The one that you've probably created a million times. And the first thing you want to know is when the network status, or the sorry, the node status is equal to duh down. That's the alert I want. But before I say I'm done or put any other little frou-frou around it, that's where I also add where custom properties and mute is equal to no. By doing that, what it means is that if I go back to my list, you see that I have a few boxes here that are muted. It doesn't matter if these servers go up or down because the alert will not trigger. I'm still collecting data on them. I'll still be able to see their node details. I'll be able to find out exactly how they're doing, but I won't get a ticket on them. Now, what it means is that all of your alerts need to be nmute aware. You need to modify all your alerts to put that test, typically at the beginning, by the way, because what you're building here is a query. So you want your most, your most broad exclusions to happen first. So if I put it toward the top, now anything that's muted is automatically ignored, and it will not match the rule, and we can move on with our lives. And then I check to see if it's up or down. Otherwise, you're checking up, down state for all 30, 40, 100, 5,000, whatever servers, and then you check if they're muted. You want to do it the other way around. That's really how it works in a nutshell. Um, and it can, but it can be very, very powerful because you can do this uh, not just with the nodes. You can also do this for volumes. Here in this alert, yes, we have the n mute. N mute is equal to no. But I also have a separate field called v mute. So when the volume is muted, that means that if the node is muted, you're not going to get anything. Okay, fine. But what if I'm not muting the node? I want to know when the node goes down. I just don't want to know when this disk is down. An example of that might be when you know the disk has been really cranky and the repair guys are coming in four or five hours to put a new disk in, and of course you know that's uh, an issue in and of itself. And uh, you know I just don't want to hear about this disk anymore. Okay, great, vmute, no problem. The other thing is that if this disk happens to be on a box that just runs hot, so it's always over ninety-five percent, you can mute that particular volume. Um, another example is where teams, and I do see this with, with disks especially, teams say, I need to know how full the drive is, I need to know what's going on, I just never care if it's going to be, uh, you know, if it's, if it's full or not. I, I'm just not worried about it. It'll show up on a report that we get weekly or what have you. So here you can see you can do that um, as well. So do you use this to do application? For applications as well? Happily, with uh, SAM actually not, uh, not 6.0, but the previous version, um, it does support, 5.5 uh, supports application custom properties also. So you can do an application mute. In, in, in my organization, we have N mute for node, V mute for volume, I mute for interface, and A mute for application. Now, the key thing there is that the application isn't for the template. So let's say that I have a standard Windows 
application template that goes to all 900 million of my Windows servers. If I do a mute, it's not going to apply to all the Windows servers. It's on a applied monitor by applied monitor basis. So for server A, application monitor Windows OS, I can mute that. So I'm still collecting the statistics, but I'm not going to get a ticket if that uh, monitor, that collection of components goes critical. So yeah, it certainly does fit into there. The thing to remember when you're when you're crafting these, and this will start to come out as you work with them, it's, it's experiential, is that the end mute is sort of the high level. If the box is muted, I don't want anything else. I don't want an application alert. I don't want a volume alert. I don't want an interface alert. All the other ones stand by themselves. So that, you know, again, as you see on the screen, the end mute is the king. Mm -hmm. It's always going to look. But then vmute is an additional layer just for volumes. So that's a, a good good okay, point. Okay, so you would want to write your query with end mute first and then the vmute. Typically, that, typically, okay. and this is this is this custom property way of mimicking the parent child. You know, it, we, we already have this in SolarWinds where you know if the device is down, you're not going to get a, an interface alert. Duh. Um, you know, so the same thing here. If the node is muted, we assume that the lower level stuff is automatically okay. out. So that's the muting concept. And like I said. I'm just giving you an idea. You can go run with it. You can create all sorts of other muting options. You know, for example, you could create a CPU mute where I don't want a CPU alert on certain boxes. Although I have another way around that, which I'll show you in a minute. But there's other situations where you may want to, you know, leverage it. So it's just, you know, more things. But this gets you started at least. So the next idea of using leveraging custom properties has to do with. Um, not writing 900 bajillion alerts for the same thing. As you see on, this, on the screen, you know, your alerts may look like this. Mine did for a really long time where I have a CPU alert specifically for AIX and a separate CPU alert for WAN routers and another CPU alert for Windows boxes and another CPU alert for that one router that keeps on complaining and that's one CPU alert for these other servers that need a lot of time to love it. It's, it's a CPU alert. Like why, why do I need these? Well, you need these because, you know, you've got a threshold. And the threshold for CPU is 95, or it's 87, or it's 22, or it's whatever it is. So how do I do that so I don't need to create separate alerts for each and every device type, each and every class of device? I have my Windows servers, my Windows 2000 servers, the Windows servers that the server team says for I shouldn't touch, the Windows server. How do I get out of that? Another custom property, this is just a, a, an example, CPU threshold. So the idea here is that I have this custom property called CPU threshold, and I can put a number there, whatever number I want. Now, you'll notice that the server called Boom Headshot is 250. Hopefully, your, your CPU never gets to 250, but I'll explain why you might want that. And just to see that in real life, you can see that in these settings, I've got a 95%, 98%, 75%, so I have the CPU threshold. The idea there is that I can create an alert. OK, we've got the mute. OK, we've got its prod. But then take a look at the next section. First of all, I have a trigger when any. This is a not as popular or not as well understood uh, element of alerting. This is where anything below is true, any of them. One, two, three, five, seven, whatever. But then I've grouped that any with two other alls. So really what I'm saying is either the first set, the trigger when all, or the second set, when either one of those is true, trigger the alert. And what are those? Well, the first all down there is if the CPU crit field, instead of CPU threshold, you can call it whatever you want. If CPU crit is empty and the CPU is greater than 95%, okay, cut your alert. But if the CPU crit field is not empty, then compare, and this is that compound element that a lot of people don't use, if the field called CPU load is greater than or equal to the field called CPU crit. So what I'm saying is it's either 95 or, in the case of this server, 98. So for this server up above, this lab exchange DAG01, since that's blank, it's going to alert when CPU is over 95%. This one, though, will not alert at 95%. Since this field is not blank, it will uh, trigger when it's at 98%. So this way, 
you can have one CPU alert, a single alert that handles your routers, your switches, your Windows servers, your Linux servers, whatever, because you're always using the CPU load, but you're saying, if I have a box or a classification of box that needs a specific, a specific threshold, I can do that. Now, one thing that comes up when I'm working with people is they say, well, well, fine, but if 95 is the default, why don't I just fill that CPU threshold field with 95 all the way down? The reason why I advocate not doing that is because later on, two weeks from now, somebody says, oh, wait, 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 I, the default isn't 95, it's actually 93. Well, now I don't know which boxes are 93 cause they're, 95 because they're the default and which ones are 95 because I specifically wanted that box to be 95. And the same thing happens three months from now. If you change the, it from 93 to 97 or whatever number, you won't know which ones were explicitly set to be that number because that box runs hot or cold or it needs more attention or whatever and which ones are simply the default. So I would recommend blank means use the default and uh, if I explicitly set it, then I explicitly set it. Now, one of the things that comes up with all of these custom properties is who changes it, when do they change it, how do they change it, all that. At its basic, I can tell you that people who have node management permission in the account manager, they're allowed to change it. If you're working for a relatively small organization, there's only three or four of you in SolarWinds in the back end doing the management stuff, it's not a problem. If you're working with a wider group of people or, in this case, when your server team realizes they can do this, they want to be able to do this, but you don't want them to be able to delete volumes or delete devices or whatever, then you need to get a little creative. The Orion Software Developer Kit, the SDK, does allow you to read and write custom properties. And it's pretty simple to write a little Visual Basic applet or a Perl applet or even Webify this so that they only have the ability to change the custom properties through that separate, uh, separate aspect. That's a way of getting around the lack of granularity in the SolarWinds administrator system. Ultimately, though, this comes down to a people process that you will put technology around, not a technology process that you'll need to, um, you know, that, that you would need to manage. So that, that works also with, like, the end mute and all that. Like, you can get your change management team to populate, hey, these machines are going on maintenance, so we don't want to alert right. that there's an issue. Right. Okay. Now, this is, I will admit, this is kludgy. If you go out on Thwack, you'll see that there's an idea out in the uh, idea exchange that says, hey, we want the big red button, we want a mute feature. It's on the roadmap someplace, I don't know where. Uh, but this isn't unmanaged, it's not schedulable. You can't really mass roll this out to a bunch of servers in the same way that you can do with unmanaged. So, you know, you really are still using a custom property in a relatively creative way. Uh, again, with the Orion SDK, you have the ability to build a little applet around that would allow you to roll it out massively. But it's still a people process that you're going to put some technology around. This goes well with, you know, RAM. It goes well with, you know, a memory alert, you know, RAM thresh. Uh, I know clients who actually do this in two levels. They actually do a crit and a warn which you can also do. Again, you know, the warning alert happens at 80%. The critical alert happens at 90%, unless one of the other ones is, you know, you have these fields filled in. Same thing for disk space. It's a wonderful way to do that. Bandwidth packet loss. Um, I did mention that whole 200% thing, and I wanted to come back to that. If you have a box that just runs hot all the time, and you want to know what the CPU is, but you never, ever, ever want a CPU alert, set the number to something impossible. Set it to 200 or 500 or 999 or whatever. It's never going to get that high, so you're never going to cut the alert for that device, but you'll always be able to collect the CPU statistics. Um, and again, you won't be crafting multiple alerts, you know, if it's this server, but not this server, but whatever, whatever. So um, you talked earlier about the unmanaged, you can schedule that. Um, so you can't schedule these types of alerts. Um, is there some reporting that you can do Very to, good. to help with that? Thank you, yes. Um, one of the things that you're going to need to know is, because it's not schedulable, what, how do I know what is muted, what isn't, and how, what's been muted for too long? So I've got this report here. It's a very simple report. It's really just, you know, give me the nodes where mute is true, and give me the mute reason. 
And this is the kind of report that you would want to glance at once a week, once whatever. Now, things I didn't put in here are things like mute date. You know, but that's easy enough to add as a date field so that when people mute things, you want to add the date and then you can tell how long it's been muted for. Now, I will point out that since uh, since Orion and PM 10.5, I believe, or 10.4, they have the audit. And, and your changing a custom property will show up in the audit properties as well, but you don't want to have to cross-reference. So you would add a date field necessarily, but here, the point is, is in this report, very simple report, I can see that there's two servers here that are muted, but there's no reason. So now I need to go in and dig and find out who muted this thing and when did they mute it. And that's where audit would show up pretty quickly and I'd be able to find it. So that's, that's another process that you can put around this to easily manage um, things that might have been muted you know, forever or someone forgot to remove the mute down the road. Do you want to do you want to add anything else about uh, custom properties? The and their uses? you know the the custom property feature really there's so many things that can be done with it and you know a lot of them get a little bit more in depth uh, than this session could go into. There's you know a CPU alert that got posted on Thwack a couple of weeks ago that uses both the CPU crit property along with a SAM element which is the um, performance capacity uh, sorry the the processor queue. Uh, where, you know, how many things do you have in the processor queue, and then you do a quick count of how many processors are on the box. If you have more processes in the processor queue, then you have CPUs to pr run the process, and the CPU is high for a particular period of time. So you can really start to use these custom properties in very creative ways. Um, you know, the disk properties, again, if you've got that typical generic owner group, right, where you say that the owner group is the Windows team, and uh, the CPU crit is great. You know, you, you can merge these custom properties to do a lot of things. Another example that people have mentioned occasionally on Thwack is that you can actually have a custom property that is an email field. Um, I didn't show this at all in the slide deck or, or anywhere, but you can actually have a field called email list so that, and then in this, in the two line, you put dollar bracket nodes dot email list and whatever's in that field is who it will email to. So again, you don't have to custom code um, a an alert, uh, in this case a trigger action, an email action, to go to this group and then you need another one to go to this group and then you need a different alert to go to this other group. You can actually put that into the email field. So they're really, really powerful um, and, and that power is often overlooked. All right. Well, um, don't forget to type your questions into, into the text field. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to your questions as, as soon as we see them. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.